on a storyteller's night. My best friend is an influencer, not big time, but with a big enough following to get free stuff, and has gotten two sponsored trips. She still works a full-time job, but does the IG thing on the side mostly because of the perks. She's not big enough to live off this yet. Anyway, this was her first trip. A little boutique hotel from Miami contacted her via IG and DM and offered her an all-expenses-paid trip to Miami for Memorial Weekend 2018 in exchange for her to be in the hotel and take pics and do a couple of stories, she was told she could bring a female friend with her if she wanted to, and everything would be covered for. This was her first time doing this, so at the time she wasn't really sure of how it worked. They sent her a bogus contract for her to sign, and it said she'd be responsible for paying for her plane ticket to Miami and that she'd be reimbursed for it later. This was to prevent a no-show, meaning the influencer gets the ticket purchased by the hotel and influencer never shows up. It seemed reasonable. She invited me, her friend, who happens to be a gay man instead of a female friend because she was nervous about the whole thing. We figured it wouldn't be a big deal. And worst case scenario, they don't want to pay for my plane ticket. She'd just cover it for me, and that's it. So the day comes and we arrived in Miami by the hotel at the airport. There's a guy holding a sign with her last name, and the paper has the hotel logo. We are greeted and we are escorted to a black SUV. Here is where it gets weird. As soon as we are going to get in the car, the driver is visibly upset. We thought he was talking to the guy who walked us over, but he was talking to my friend. He had a very thick accent and was wearing dark shades. He was telling my friend that she was not allowed to bring her boyfriend, me, and that she said it was two girls, two girls, hotel told me two girls, not one girl, one guy, but two girls. He was demanding to see where the other girl was. We were speechless and confused. The guy who walked us to the car looked annoyed, got in the passenger seat and started to fight with the driver in Portuguese, it wasn't Spanish. Then he turns to us and asks where the other girl is at. My friend tells them, very upset by now, that there is no other girl and that I'm just a friend coming with her on the trip. The big guy in the passenger seats gets out, tosses our luggage out of the car and says something like, this is total BS gets in the car, and they take off. That was it. We were in shock. Utter and complete shock. My friend immediately emails Melissa, the PR person we had been in contact through email with, to tell her what happened. No response. We decided to take a cab and show up to the hotel. When we show up is when everything made sense. The hotel had been rebranded and had a completely different name, owner, and staff. We show them the IG, and is indeed the IG of the hotel it used to be, but not the new one. They never contacted us. They never did anything. Whoever was in charge of the old IG account for the old hotel did, or whoever got a hold of it did. Mind you, this was a somewhat big hotel account. With 10K followers, it was real. But upon further inspection, we realized the pics were really old, and so were the posts. My friend felt like an idiot and would not stop crying. We called the police, met up with a detective. Nothing ever came out of it. They investigated who was running the account before or who had access to it. None of the people who used to run that account had anything to do with it. Nothing ever came out of this. It's upsetting and scary to know that whoever wanted to abduct my friend or any other girls by using this old hotel Instagram knows who my friend is. That IG has since been deleted and we never heard anything from anyone ever again. But to think my friend would have been kidnapped had she gone with another girl instead of me sends chills down my spine. I deliver pizza and I'd been having a really busy night non-stop back and forth without any time to even pause and take a leak. I'd been so busy that I wasn't really thinking about bathroom breaks. But we're also going through a bit of a heat wave in our area, so I've been drinking copious amounts of water. 
All of a sudden, as I was driving to this particular delivery, the urge to go hit me, like things went from zero to 60 in an instant. Thankfully, I was close to the customer, so could get this one over with quickly. Or so I thought. I pulled up to the house, and it was an area I'd delivered in before, so I could immediately see that something wasn't right. All the lights were off in the house, not even the glow of a television or anything. It was extra apparent because the streetlight closest to the door happened to be out of order. And on top of it all, the block was dead quiet. This is a big university area, and obviously there aren't many student renters in July, but there had to be at least one person, because someone ordered this pizza. Maybe they just liked sitting in the dark, or they were out back in the yard. Whatever, I just didn't want to get out of my car and knock on a quiet house in the middle of the night, around 9.30 p.m., without first checking that I had the correct address and the customer was inside. It was scorching that night, even after sundown. My car's AC is a joke, and the piping hot pizzas don't help things much, so I have to try and open the car door as infrequently as possible to keep any cool air in. I called the number the customer provided, and the voice on the other end said, kind of brusquely and out of breath. Yeah? I just tried to keep it clear and concise. Hey, it's your pizza out front, but there doesn't appear to be anybody home. And the customer replied, still gasping for air. Yeah, I'm not home. I had to pee so badly by that point that I was much less patient than I'd otherwise be with a customer right out of the gate. Well, then we're going to have to terminate the order because I've arrived in the stated delivery window and you were supposed to pay in cash, so I don't know what to tell you. Plan ahead next time. I instantly regretted letting my bladder do the talking for me as the voice on the other end came through more clearly as a young, bubbly, and very distraught girl who couldn't have been older than 20 or 25. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry I was running down the street so I could barely hear you. She cried. I just switched you out of my AirPods. Is that better? Sorry, I completely lost track of time at work, but I knew you were coming. That's why I'm literally running home right now. Please don't leave. I'm starving and I don't have a car. Seriously, please don't leave. Five minutes tops, okay? I know what it's like to be hungry and running late and have no car but not live near any restaurants. Plus, when I heard her voice, I began to remember more specifically having delivered to this place a couple times before, and she'd always been perfectly nice. Now I felt bad for snapping at her. I tried to walk it back, while simultaneously looking out my window for potential spots to pee. No, no, my bad. I'm letting the heat get to me, and it's not your fault. No need to rush. See you when you get here. I hung up and, while surveilling the street, was starting to think I was really out of luck. All the other houses had people in them, and were close together so there were no clumps of trees or out-of-the-way patches of land or anything. Of course, I had just tossed my empty water bottle at the last delivery, because I'm an idiot. Finally, I decided it was escalating to the point of an emergency, and the safest bet was to use a bush in front of the woman's house. She wasn't home. The streetlight was out, so no one would see me. The people who were home were inside, my car was parked across the street. Animals pee outside all the time. Humans are animals. This is fine. I scurried over to the tallest bush in her front yard. She didn't really have much of a yard, more just a walkway lined with bushes and flowers that ran adjacent to her front door. The biggest cluster of bushes, the only one where I could be sure there would be no visible splatter on the side of the house, was about four feet from her door. I looked both ways, unzipped, and let fly. After the initial millisecond of relief, I noticed the sound was way off, more like pissing on something solid than something leafy. I started panicking, thinking I'd aimed wrong, but once I start, I can't stop midstream, so I kept squinting into the darkness to see if maybe I was hitting a key rock or something and could just move a few inches over. Instead, all of a sudden, I heard a way more concerning noise, a deep voice exclaiming, What the hell? 
and before I could turn around, assuming I'd been caught by a neighbor, a man came leaping out of the bushes. He blew by me, brushing off what I'd accidentally splashed on him as he did. He spit pretty emphatically on the ground, so I think I might have accidentally splashed him right in the face. I didn't see where he went after a few paces, but, though this next part is kind of a blur, I do think I remember hearing a car screech out from a bit further away after a minute. I'd gotten some night vision by that point, so I was able to make out his height, build, and outfit, but only the most general details of each. I just stood there trying to figure out what had happened. The reality was so terrifying that my mind refused to accept it and impulsively searched for a reasonable explanation that could make everything okay. I thought, could these bushes lead to some backyard area and just looked like they were against the house? Could they have been obscuring an open window? My inner voice was desperately screaming, bruh, that man was wearing a hoodie in 90 degree weather. That was a bad man. You're in a bad situation. But the very idea that I was within inches of a guy who would be hiding in bushes at all, let alone in front of a young woman's house at night, just wasn't something I was ready to grapple with yet. I was coping by not coping. My fight or flight response totally failed me at that point because my dumbass did the absolute last thing I should have done and approached the bushes to try and validate this. There must have been a good reason for a man in a hoodie to be behind these bushes in the middle of the night. So I walked over to the side, turned on my phone flashlight, and tried to peer around the line of shrubbery. Pro tip, as scary as things may look in the dark, seeing them with a single beam of your flashlight can sometimes make it even worse. That's when I saw the bag. There was a tattered drawstring bag sitting behind the bushes, slightly splashed with pee. But I was in such a moronic daze from shock that I groped around for it thinking, see, this is it. This will explain why he was back here. Once I maneuvered it over and pulled it open, I saw a sharp knife, a roll of duct tape, a bottle of pills. The delusions officially broke at that point and all the adrenaline, endorphins, and self-preservation instincts that had been suppressed kicked in ten times over. I became whatever the opposite of dazed is, more laser-focused than I have ever been in my life, with one singular goal, get back to my car. I dropped the bag, booked it across the street, got in my car, and slammed the pedal to the floor before the door was even all the way closed. I went as far as I could, as fast as I could, until I hit a red signal. Then I pulled off to the side and realized I shouldn't be driving any more than necessary in the condition I was in. I pulled into the parking lot of a 24-hour drugstore and took a breath. I was finally calm and coherent enough to zip up and formulate a plan of action. My first lucid thought was, who do I call first? the police or the girl whose house that was. I thought about it for what couldn't have really been more than 10 seconds, but felt like an hour, and decided, okay, I am in my locked car with the engine running. If trouble starts, I can drive away. I know something's up, she might not. She needs to know not to keep walking in that direction. But as I was dialing her number, it occurred to me, what if there was no girl? I thought I remembered delivering to that house before, but what if I was wrong? What if the girl on the phone was just a decoy to get me there to rob me or worse? Every pizza guy on the planet has seen the Evil Genius documentary by now, so I thought, she called me all out of breath. She wasn't home. The whole thing was off. Can't risk it. I'll start with the cops. I called 911. The operator was very helpful in keeping me calm because I was a complete wreck by this point. He kept assuring me that someone would be there soon. I kept telling them they had to get there before the girl did, but I was trying to express three thoughts at once and really damaging my own credibility. It came out more as, you've got to save this girl because he wasn't after me. I was just delivering a pizza. 
unless they were after me, in which case there might not be a girl, but I talked to one on the phone, so then you should find that girl, because they used her to lure me there. But if she's real, she doesn't know about the guy, who was also real, and there could be more guys if there's actually a girl. And you know what? Even if there isn't a girl, there might actually be more guys. I only checked one part of the bushes, so I don't actually know. But we'll know which guy is the one I saw, because I pissed all over him, you know. I didn't mean to. This was back when I thought the girl was real but not home, but she might be real so you really need to find her if she is because the guy was real. Finally, they basically just asked me to stop talking and stay on the line. But that was when I saw an incoming call from the customer. I couldn't answer it without disrupting my 911 call, so I just ignored it. But then she sent me this text like, Hey, I'm here, don't see you. I told 911 she was there, and they said officers were only minutes away. But who knows how long that meant, especially after I'd given such a scattered account of the events in my panic. I just felt overwhelmed with guilt, because my rational mind said the odds of her being a decoy girl for some large scam targeting pizza guys were low, and the odds of her being the intended victim of a predator were high. So I put my 911 call on mute, where I can hear them, but they can't hear me, and turned back, heart absolutely pounding out of my chest, compulsively muttering, no, 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 the entire way. Then I took 911 off mute and told them I had returned to look for the girl. They weren't happy about that but I saw her meandering past the parked cars in the street, looking to see if one was mine, and I waved her down, flashing my brights. She bounced on over to the window of my car, happy-go-lucky. I figured that was a good sign that she wasn't in on whatever this was. But I was just so scared to be back in the general area and to not know what had just happened or what was going to happen. I kept whispering, get in, get in, and she was like, Get it? Huh? Oh, you want me to get the pizza from the back? I didn't want to make the same mistake with her that I had made with 911. So instead of trying to tell the whole story, I stuck to the bare basic facts. There was a man in your bushes. I'm on the phone with the police. I don't know where he is right now. Please get in the car so we can lock the doors. I was barely able to get even those sentences out, and I was shaking like I'd had 10 cups of black coffee. I held up my phone with 911 on the call screen to verify it for her. I thought that was why she got in the car with no further explanation, but it turns out that wasn't entirely it. You still there? Is she with you? Are you safe? Is anyone else there? 911 kept checking in, not knowing who the third party I was talking to was. I reassured them, and we drove, more cautiously this time, to a location 911 instructed us to wait at to speak with police after they cleared the area. I didn't actually have to do much after that. The police came pretty soon after. A police car met us, I gave a statement telling them everything I observed, and she went to go speak to more officers in more detail than they needed me for. It turns out, the reason she got right into a strange pizza guy's car without probing any deeper into my story is because she knew who the man was right away from my description. She had an abusive ex-boyfriend who was apparently psychotic enough that he immediately came to mind from hearing, there's a guy in your bushes. She later called us to thank me and insist on leaving a huge tip. I wasn't there when the call came in, so the kid who answered didn't know to refuse to accept the money. But the manager already promised the next time we see her, we can load her up with enough one free pie cards to last a lifetime. Easily the scariest thing that has ever happened to me, on the job or off. I don't get the chance to tell the story much because I try to avoid sharing it with anyone who could possibly know the girl or know of the event but I'm still not the same since. Even though I know he didn't even have anything to do with me directly, this truly shook me to my core. I don't remember how old I was, 
just that I was small enough to fit in the front baby seat of a grocery cart. That had put us in the late, very late, 90s, early 2000s. I was grocery shopping with my mom at a Costco. For, for those who don't know the chain, it's basically a huge warehouse where everything is sold in bulk. Food, clothes, books. It's basically a Walmart. But if Walmart sold cereal boxes in counts of threes or frozen dinners by the dozen, my mom has a habit of pulling her grocery cart down to one side of the aisle in stores and then walking the length of the shelves, picking what she wants, and then coming back to the cart and dumping what she has in the basket. I don't get why she does it, but hey, moms do weird things, so I'm maybe four or five, sitting in the front basket playing with my Game Boy Color when she pulls over next to a fruit display in Costco and tells me that she's going to look at the different deals and to sit tight. I wasn't a very fidgety kid, so I said no problem. She's gone for a couple of minutes. I'm absorbed in Pokemon, so I don't really notice her walk up until the cart starts moving. Being a kid, I instinctively trust she's the one pushing the cart. I was wrong. After a moment or two, I catch out of the corner of my vision her red nails. This is a problem because my mom never paints her nails and never, ever wears them long. I look up. The lady pushing the cart is a little older than my mother. Same curly black hair, but pulled into a ponytail at the nape of her neck. I still remember she had tanned Italian-type skin with thick red lips, a heavy coat of eyeliner and brown eyes. She was pretty skinny, her teeth were yellowed, and she smelled like, what I didn't realize until later, bad B.O. This wasn't my mom, and I said so very loudly. She laughed and looked around and pushed the cart a little faster, I said it again, and she looked me dead in the eyes and said, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't remember the exact wording, Oh, sweetie, what game are you playing? I am your mom. So the way Costco is set up, at least ours, is that in the produce area, instead of aisles, they're more like islands. They're large square setups that you can see the entire length of the produce section if you walk in that area. So of course, I can see my actual mother a few displays away. As loud as I could, I remember yelling, Mom! and watching her head whip around to look at me, right as this lady is trying to cover my mouth with her hand. I don't know if she decided then I wasn't worth it because I was so noisy, or if looking at my mother charging from a few displays over, a side note, my mom is not a petite woman. She's built like a linebacker and played roller derby and softball throughout college up until I was about 10. She's more of an ox than a human woman, but that's what I appreciate about her. But anyways, this woman squeezed her hand around my little face once and then booked it. My mom comes running up to me and starts asking me a million questions at once. And my little brain thinks all the sudden that I'm in trouble for using my outdoor voice inside because she looks mad, so I start to cry. By the time she calmed me down, the lady was already gone, and reporting her to the head of security did bupkis. Store never found her inside, and security cam footage showed her leaving, but never with anyone else. Don't know why she picked me or what it would have been for, but I'm just glad my real mom ended up scaring her away and that nothing became of it. Thank you.